Hello, welcome back to the Knights of Awakening. I'm your host, Justin, and joining me today for part two, review of Superhuman, the Invisible Made Visible, I have Allie and Charles. Hey, hey! We are back. So this is part two of a, I don't know how many parts, because that first part was probably already way too long, but we're going to do our best to get through this. We'll probably be three or four parts. I, I'm going to be like Allie during Acts. I'm going to say, it's two parts. And then the next recording, <laughs> was, it's going to be like ten parts. And then it turned out to be 15. No, it was only four parts. <laughs> four parts. Right. Four parts, yeah. All right, so just to kind of recap, we talked about remote viewing last time, and you really need to check that out because it kind of sets the tone of this whole rest of this thing for Allie. For me, this starts to get more interesting. This is where I have fun. Chapter 2, it's called A Physical Body with Non-Physical Abilities. So we start off, we meet Dr. Raiden again, and he's in charge of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Ions. Ions. Uh, he's their chief scientist. They're going to have this experiment, and they're going to... This experiment was weird for me. I didn't, I didn't... I really... I never could figure out what this is supposed to be telling us. I thought it was kind of lame, for lack of a better term. Before I get into the experiment, do you guys have any uh, comments up to, up to where the experiment starts? Yeah, this one's actually really interesting, and I know a lot about this. Okay. Even Nathan so, said this is the only interesting one so far. <laughs> okay. See, I, I'm, on, I'm on a different planet then, because to me it was like, oh... So, you, so different pictures make your eyeballs, your pupils move. Anyway, so I'm going to lay out the experiment, and then we'll talk about it, okay? So the experiment is to try to measure the physical effects on intuitive abilities. So basically, they have a set of pictures, and these pictures are designed to elicit some kind of emotional or calming reaction out of a person, right? Some of them, like, like a person on fire versus... Uh, you know, a, a picture of a beach on the Caribbean somewhere or something, just kind of give you a, a, an idea. The goal is to see how much the pupil dilates, but they're measuring it seconds or like a, a half a second or something, like a few milliseconds before the picture is coming to gauge to see if the person got a sense for what was coming already. Is that, is that a fair way to say it? Okay. Yep. So they have this computer, and it has this, this I, I assume that little bar at the bottom was a camera, that was focused in on the eyeballs to, to track the, the dilation. Mm -hmm. What I got out of this was they were attempting to see if there was physical proof of intuit intuitive abilities. Allie, what did you think about this experiment? Why was it so interesting for you? I found it interesting because they did it in a different way than what I'm used to seeing. Mm -hmm. And it actually measures faster by doing it this particular way than it does in the original experiment, which, if I remember correctly, was you had a button. Okay, yeah. And you were clicking. So it's supposed to measure what, what the theory is. is actually slightly different than what they're presenting it in here, and it was that you actually live a few seconds in the future. Like your, okay. consciousness, your consciousness is actually in the future, and not so much you're measuring your intuition. Okay. It's slightly different. It's ever so slightly different. So not really enough to really make it, it it's negligible difference, in my opinion. Right, yeah. Explain, explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they would do this, and it would be a button, and you would have to anticipate, or you would anticipate before whether or not you were going to see something. But they're measuring with the eyes, and this is why I think it's better, is because with the button, you've taken the hearing test from the military, right? Mm -hmm. So then you know how easy it is to have phantom Sure. Action. So to me, that, that has always, since I never really got a chance to peer review the material myself, that was always a question mm -hmm. I had was, what about the phantom? Did you account for the phantom possibilities with the button? Right. But in this, because they're actually measuring the eyes doing mm -hmm. it, then it's not something that you can easily phantom. That's a really good point. You can't BS it at all. Your eyes are going to react. It's like, it's like when you do the, the test for people who are impaired by drugs or alcohol. They can't control their eyeballs, their pupils. Right. Right. So now, that's, that's a only, good point. Yeah. The only exception to this question is, are we sure that it was randomized and not in a pattern? That's the question I have to ask. Right. And because I wasn't there, again, I wasn't there to review what they were doing, and they weren't really in the room either to see what was going on. They're just taking it on faith that this is going on, that this is happening. Mm -hmm. It's a very good experiment. I'd like to see it more replicated with this specifically using the eyes mm -hmm. and to actually have the papers to peer review myself. But this one, this one was on point. Yeah. I really liked this one. That's a really good point. The eyes don't lie. I didn't think of it that way. That's, thank you for that. Well, I'll tell you, as I was watching it, that was the first thing that I thought about was 
is the timer random? And are they measuring if there's a difference in the response or if there's a response? Because the thing is, if your eyes are acclimated to a timer interval of a shift in light, I'll say the iris, I probably got my terminology wrong, is going to dilate in an effort to pull in that light at that moment or it's going to try to close itself to protect itself from the shift in colors. So even if you randomize the pictures, did you randomize the timer? And are we only looking to see if we're getting a response for the shocking ones, or are we comparing the response differences? None yeah, because we never get a, we never get a baseline for what his pupils look like for calm versus whatever. Right. Yeah. And nor nor do we get this tested against multiple people. Right. Just in case this person's already went through this and it is patterned one. Not to mention that he is already a believer. Right. Right. I mean, you're kind of led to believe he already believes he's Caroline's friend. Now, and, yeah. what the person in charge of this test at this point, though, they do only explain how it's happened. They don't try to explain the what of, or the why. Exactly. Why. And I like yep. that better. Yep. That made the test a little bit better for me by explaining just, well, this is what we're measuring and this is yeah. what we... And they even they didn't even say... And the test anything. subject, yeah, the test subject actually uses some buzzwords... To mm -hmm. explain it, and 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 Doctor uh, Raiden, I think his name is right, Doctor Raiden. Yeah, he says, hey, I don't know what it is. We're just going to say some subconscious process. He just yeah. says that it's statistically improbable to get this result. Right. Yeah. Which is, so, which is what word last time was disingenuous. Yeah. But yeah. with this one, I would say it was it was legit. If you've never looked yeah. into the Institute of Noetic Sciences, it's a very very interesting place. They do some really good work. From, from what I've seen or heard from them before. So I was actually happily happy that they were included in this, to be honest with you. I thought the experiment was boring, but I'm not a science guy, man. I, I like science because it helps me stay in that healthy lane where I, I can believe these things that I can't understand, but I can also, you know, question things too. Pointed out to me, Ali, that uh, uh, why we would use the eyes for that. It's a really good example. I, I forgot about the clicky test. I do. I, I am familiar with that, and I forgot about that. I like Dr. Raiden so far. He seems to be genuinely trying to be a scientist, and he's trying to, to help us figure out why these things happen, not you what know, they are. One other thing also, without knowing how they program their software for measuring the time between the image shift and the eyes, light travels a different distance from, that, from the camera reading the eyes as it would from the screen and a couple other different things. It is still possible that you're getting a false positive, even with that, without knowing how the software is written, right. without knowing more about the type of camera that was used. And we I don't like know how many people he's done this on. I mean, he could have done this on thousands of people. And you, you, could easily, you could easily calibrate your software with a slight delay just by accident of having it, when it throws up the code to, throw, to put the picture up, it runs a routine that takes longer to run. Right. Than, than what you need for the test, and you're not accounting for the time it takes to draw to the screen. Like, as, as you're watching this and listening, our screens have reproduced the images of us moving at least 30 times within a second to create motion that seems consistent, and more than likely 60 to 75 to even 144 times in one second. So since we're measuring hundreds, and tenths of a second and less, it is very possible that the time it takes to execute the code completely to draw the image is longer than the time it takes to then record the reaction in the eye. You would almost need to run multiple computers in parallel for the eye part and then a separate computer running the image machine, and I don't know that they did that, and I didn't think about it until we started talking about lookup tables in the other video. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, you know what? I've been doing a little bit of video game programming research, and you don't think about how long it takes to draw the image to the screen, but you will not draw that image faster than one frame out of 60. You just can't do it. It's very possible that that image is popping up, affecting the eye, but the routine is not running until the image has created an elapse of two frames, for instance, within the draw routine or that that image is up there and that it's got to wait two frames before it accesses the break command to then check the scanner. Now, like I, I said, don't know I that that's need, happening. I would need to peer review this to yeah. really... I would, I would have, to, I would have to tear their code and machine apart, to be honest. I would, have to, I would have to know the specs of every single piece of equipment on a hardware level. You would, you would probably see that in, in the peer review, too. You would see the specs. Not, and, not necessarily. You would, you would see that there was a machine used 
but you might not see the code that was used. And like I said, if the code is tied together as one program, that's a big fault right there, because if it's one program running this, back then, what was this, 2005, 2008, this was recorded? No. no. 2018. No. It, 2018. Yeah, 2018. 2018, even with a multi-core even with a multi-core processor, you have a single scheduling system in it. That scheduling system still takes a, a point of time before it hands off drawing that image to the processor, and that's assuming they coded it multi, multi-threaded. If they didn't well, code it multi-threaded... We have to give them the benefit of the doubt, especially Dr. Raiden, because he seems genuinely interested in the results. So let's, I, just, assume, let's just assume that, that he has taken every, every step possible to make it as accurate as possible. So, within his knowledge, because he does he's do not a two more experiments. He does what? He does two more experiments, and there right, are right, right. problems with those experience, experiments that I could pick up with right off the bat. So, my thing is, he does everything he can within his knowledge and experience of the tools he's using, but if he is not a pro, only, only someone who has coded as much as I did when I was 14, and now off in one for fun, would right. think, oh, wow. That takes, you know, one billionth of a millisecond, not one billionth, probably closer to one, one millionth, one millionth of a second to put this image on the screen, but light travels much faster. Like, your processor does not act anywhere near the speed of light. It's not even close. It's the speed at which it transfers data. So as soon as that image, right, as soon as that first pixel pops up on your screen, right, your eye could dilate in an effort to get the image properly, and you would not be aware of it. So unless he used multiple computers, and like I said, only a programmer, there is no amount of physics training that's going to make you go, I wonder how long it takes to draw that image on the screen, because right. you take it for granted as you use the screen all the time, images come up when you tell them to. You so, just take so, it for granted at this instance. So, so let me bring you back to this, because now we're falling into that trap that we're accusing them of. We're, we're trying to now prove them wrong, right? Instead, instead of looking at, at what they're trying to show us. So they're trying to show us that there is intuitive abilities, at least for a second or two. That's what this experiment is trying to prove. So do you believe that, that there is some intuitive element here that maybe can't be recorded uh, because of the limitations of the computers and the programming and stuff? So I guess my question is, because we don't have the equipment to accurately, exactly uh, do these things like you're saying, does that still negate the intuitive part of this? No, not at all. I think we've seen intuition work so often in human beings. This is anecdotal evidence, but my grandfather once kicked a door down to keep my mother from drowning when she passed out in a tub when she was ill because he knew something was wrong. There is no amount of, oh, well, you can't prove that, that then just proves the fact that he kicked the door down and grabbed her out of the right. tub before she drowned. You can't look at that and say, well, we can't reproduce it in a lab. No, you're right. You can't reproduce it in a lab. Because very rarely are you going to have a laboratory situation where you're going to drown someone <laughs> and then see if their dad will kick the door right. down before they get Exactly. It. We have a lot of inconclusive anecdotal evidences towards precognition, which is enough for me as a practitioner of similar arts right. to say, yes, I believe it's there. Do I believe this experiment proves it on a scientific level? without an analysis of the machines, as a programmer, as someone who's used and worked on computers on a high and low level most of his life at different points, I cannot say it is conclusive. But I would love to pull apart their hardware. You know what I would, I would, I would, David uh, sent me a video, and I can't remember if we did a show on it or not. I don't know if that show ever made the cut to Anchor. I'll have to look. But as kind of like a, a follow-up to this show, uh, I'm going to have you guys watch that TED Talk. Uh, and it's from a scientist that says why the scientific method doesn't work. It's fascinating, right? Have you guys heard that before? Have you, seen, have you heard that video? I have it, but I've, I've got... I personally believe that when it comes to faith, specifically, yeah. you right. can't replicate it. And this is something that I, have, that I try to tell some of my students. There's so many things that go into the concept of faith itself yeah. that the scientific method cannot account for it because it's missing information that you can't right. get unless you can read that person's mind. Unless, uh, yeah, and then and you it, have to prove that you can read their mind. The truth is the same as psychology, have, too. Yeah, and there's faith in that, too. you got to yeah. have faith that they're not lying to you, yeah. It's a rabbit hole this big. It's like, let me just fall into it. 
it's crazy. But you know, with, within within science, is there science is broken up into more than one category too. We tend to look at things like physics because in school you learn about things like physics and biology, where formulas can be applied, or chemistry, where you know have no numbers and no reactions. But chemistry fails all the time. You know, bullets are perfectly measured, so it has to have the right chemical compound. And a factory is very controlled conditions, and yet one thing goes wrong somewhere in that mm -hmm. system, and suddenly a bullet misfires. Physical sciences are sciences where we try to understand the physical world, and those don't have controlled laboratory experiments. They have conditional information, and then they have theories that are called that are called general theories and incomplete theories. This is a physical science situation. Mm -hmm. This is something where we're dealing with something that is a reaction of a biological organism in a complex situation. The same level of minutia that you can... I don't call that physical science. To me, I was, physical it was always science, called physical sciences to me. No, physical science to me is like geology. Like earth I, science, yeah. It was, it was always grouped together. Yeah. I'm a product of the California public school system, so take what I say as a great result. We, we, we I call I it come, earth sciences. <laughs> I I come I come from from up north in Maryland, where the terminology changed every three years. So I've got a lot of terms to use, but not not one of them is probably perfect. But my point is, these sciences are day to day sciences. They're sciences that are applied at that moment. So I I wouldn't demand necessarily the level of controls for this experiment that I would say for a chemical reaction in a laboratory with completely sterile Which equipment. Which is chemistry, like a vaccine not or physical something. science, chemistry, by like the way. Right. <laughs> like a medication or a vaccine or something. You would, you right. would want yeah. to really be, yeah. But at the same time, if I was not a programmer, okay, I kid you, I don't even have this in my notes. It hit me while we were talking. If I was not a programmer, I would never think about the processor delay between telling the video card to put the image on the screen and measuring input coming from it, it, an external it, device. It is a viable thing. It is. It, it's something. But here's the thing also. For all I know, they had 12 computers and three cameras and yeah. four different programs running at one time on those 12 computers to make sure this was not a problem, in which case my reasoning is invalid. What we're running into, and we, we touched upon this in the last video, but we're, we're, we're running into a problem with just the movie-making process itself. Whereas these lists of people that we're meeting are probably standouts in their fields. Why would they be featured if they're not standouts for one thing or the other? Paul Smith, well, that's, we'll just forget about him. But these other guys, <laughs> they, they have a lot of impressive work. They, you know what, though? I mean, I agree with you. A lot of these guys have impressive work. However, at one point in time, Nathan, Nathan sees, you know, they're, they're interviewing these random people. Nathan oh, yeah, the, rand the randos, yeah. He I haven't written down his randos. Goes, he goes, I know who that is. And he pulls up a podcast that he watched. They had yeah. like 100K followers. That's it. Right. It's about 100K followers. And he goes, see, see. And like he plays it for me and he shows me that he's like, that's, that's the guy. And the voice matches up, the yeah. look matches up, everything. So his, he said it's possible they just put out a cast call. And that's how they uh, attracted these people. Well, I mean, obviously, all these people have have something to prove, and they all have something in common, for sure, for sure. Um, and and, and uh, Caroline, uh, like like we've said before, Caroline, this isn't her first day on the job uh, of trying to prove or work within this environment. So right, but you know, my point is, is that you're like they're standout people. They might not. No, be. I'm just saying. I'm just her. saying as far as their field of expertise, right? So like, I've never heard of quantum biology before. Right, so if you put ten people who are quantum biologists and they pick this one person because maybe they have they're the best at explaining whatever that is, that's what I mean by by the standouts in their okay, field. I mean, I got you. Yeah. Because I mean, a lot of these stuff I don't know a lot of these people. I don't know any of them to be honest with you. Um, I only know Carolyn in passing from like coast to coast AM. I'm not trying to tear Dr. Raiden apart, but he's got a degree in electrical engineering and a mm -hmm. PhD in educational psychology without a good set of courses on computer programming and architecture, he would not think, I'll put it this way, if, if I d had not devoted so much time in my youth to it, if I was, if I hadn't been interested in game development, 
okay, specifically, where every tick of that clock cycle matters, I would not think about the delay. Even if I was just a normal programmer, I'd be like, oh, no, that's instant. We are led to believe, and I will, I will say this, we are led to believe with each of these people that they engineered or built these experiments personally. We're led to believe that. So I have to assume that Dr. Radin built that people. experiment. See, I assume with the nature of the complexity of the tools that Dr. Radin hired someone on college campus with a fair degree of programming experience to write most of the code in assembler so it would run fast and that he walked up to them and as a, a great quote from one of my podcasts on game design said once he handed them a bucket of earth money and said make yeah. this work and, I don't but, I, but yeah, I don't think, I, I don't think he has that kind of stretch. I'm not going to tear it apart yeah this, yeah, this one I, in particular I don't want to tear apart because I know that it has basis in other things well, yeah, and, 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 and again, I, I have to. I, we have to assume that that they're genuinely trying to show us. I do believe that they conducted the experiment in this instance to the best of their ability within the knowledge they have. I would well, love like, to. I would love to talk to this man and be like, "Well, did you account for delays in processor cycles?" Because if he says yes, and I and I have reason to believe he says yes because he shows me the code where it where it accounts for that, I'd be like, "That's awesome," but. Again, it's, it's kind of like being a missile technician and someone's describing something a missile does that all missiles do but no one knows about. When you're a programmer and you see something like this, if you've got the experience to, to know or to run into situations in much older computers, which is when I was programming, where these cycle delays could cause issues, once it stands out, it's real hard not to think about it, that's for sure. Okay, so moving on. Let's, let's move on to... The open water experiment. The open water, yeah, the, the, the changing of the pH balance. You remember the, that benefit uh, of the uh, doubt I gave earlier? It's going so, away. So, again, <laughs> we're meeting Dr. Glenn Rhine, who's a DNA researcher and a, a quantum biologist, something like that, right? I think that's what this is, quantum biologist. We, we know that this guy built this experiment. We know because he, he says he did. So... We're just going to assume all the variables are accounted for because, well, he's the one that the equipment that he uses and all the all the stuff is as he calibrated it. So we're not going to get into that to that argument again. The experiment is to show a change in pH balance, acidity levels, basically in the water. Now, the the experiment set up like this. There is a little device in the water that that mat, that, that supposedly measures uh, the pH balance, right? Very accurately, like down to the like the smallest little detail. The goal in this experiment, the first experiment, because there's two experiments here. The goal in the first experiment is to use intention, thoughts, to change the pH balance in the water. They show the water there, and they show a little device in it, and uh, Caroline is the person that's going to change the pH balance in the water. And I think about 10 minutes goes by, right, from start to finish. She, she takes about 10 minutes, and she gives the attention... That she yeah, wants to five lie. Minutes. Five exact minutes. They time. Okay. It. Okay. Well, they waited ten minutes though for the full readings to go. Yeah, she did her little thing. Yeah, they did. An hour. I think they watched nope. it for an hour first. Did they? Are you sure? Yeah, and then she changed it within five minutes, quote unquote. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm remembering it different than you. Yeah, I just watched it again today. So, uh, okay. It, that's okay. That's fine. Either way, either way. She supposedly changed the pH balance from like 7.57 to 7.47, which in his conclusion was a huge difference. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I am not an expert in, in water chemistry. If I, I, I drink it, it tastes like crap, I spit it out. About as far as my expertise goes in water. So what do you guys think about the first experiment? We'll get into the DNA experiment next, but what do you think about this one? Uh, Charles, do I get... what's that word that I can't say? Log 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 Logarithmic? That one. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> okay. The first thing I did was I go, well, pH in water changes all the time. It drops because pH is, is a measure of, of a kind of a chemical electrical state where you're measuring chemicals that are breaking down. So the first thing I did was I looked up pH changes in water over time. And I found out that when they do a reading on stormwater, when they have to read for stormwater, there's an article, and I can link you to the article if you'd like, but you're not going to have time to read in the middle of the show. It titled, Does the pH of a stormwater sample change over time? Why 15 minutes are crucial. So if 15 minutes are crucial to getting an accurate reading, then 5 minutes are significant. 
for a reading to change, which means that from the time they read the baseline, right, mm -hmm. if that pH is decreasing any amount over a five-minute period, that shows that you don't have a control because you don't have another sample of water there that's being measured without effect. Right, 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 right. So yeah. at that moment, my head exploded, okay? Mm -hmm. Nathan was sitting there. He felt this shake rattle the windows as my head exploded. <laughs> because to put this very simply, what the water did is exactly what we expected the water to do. It's supposed to do that, yeah. And she's taking credit for it, so I guess she right. thinks she's God. And I'm, I was starting to get that impression, but I made a note. What I would like to have seen instead was her raise the pH. If she could right. raise the pH of that water. As excited as they were, I was expecting it to have gone down to like two or something. You know what I mean? Like a lot. Like, like you've almost turned this into wine at this point, right? Well, well it, it does. It <laughs> okay, does. I am looking at it. It says, I measured the pH over the course of an hour. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So I was right, an hour. And then in five minutes, she dropped it. But here's the thing. A speck of dust can change this pH. So he measured it in a closed an open container. open water experiment. This is a small vial, people. If I could take a screenshot, I might actually be able to take a photo of it. So the transfer into the vial could cause it. The reactivity of the vial's chemical makeup could cause it, and the the fact that it's being poured through the air, which is aerating it, would almost certainly cause a pH shift. So what he needed to do in order to make this actually a, a closed system, which would make me actually believe what was going on, but he didn't do it, I said open water experiment for a reason. If he had closed the vial in such a way that nothing could get into it, I would have taken this as, okay, yeah. Because he measured it over the course of an hour, and it did, it did drop a little, right. I think is what he said. It dropped slightly. Yeah. But he also didn't have a whole lot of interaction. You have someone coming in there and moving around it, breathing. All kinds of things are now being introduced to this that were not introduced before because he didn't have it closed. That part didn't bother me as much as the grand conclusion that they made from this, was that because she was able to drop it by like one hundredth of a whatever, that automatically means that we can, we can raise and lower the pH levels of our body at will, just like that. That was yeah. like the grand conclusion they came to, right? Right. Uh, and, and that's very much... That, it, it, it's a little dangerous. If you go online, you can see people that blame poor pH levels on cancer and things like that, right? Like, they... So they they are victim blaming at this point. You I'm not... Yourself. No, 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 that's what I'm right, saying. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, because, like, I read an article years ago about how if you could keep your pH to some perfect level, you'll never get sick, you'll never get cancer, you'll never get any of that, which we know is, right, that's not... Yeah. But to automatically, to, to, to say that you can change your pH levels to, to points where your body will never get sick, if you put those two ideas together, it gets really dangerous. You know, pe people will stop going to doctors. People will stop seeking, you know, other kinds of treatments. It, it's, it's dangerous, I think, to just automatically assume or tell people from a position of authority, if you could, you could just do this at will, which, which look, there, there's lots of anecdotal evidence that we can control things in our body with our thoughts, through meditation, through focusing, but that doesn't automatically assume that we can make our pH perfect, our cells perfect, our... Right. Is that possible? And Maybe. You that, but you'd, have to, you'd really have to be able to show how you're doing it, too. Exactly. You can't really yeah. replicate that. She said, I put the intention of pu pushing it down. Yeah. And then it doesn't, it goes down. You know, I think also linking this to some kind of health benefit based on just will alone, well, I think yeah. mind frame and will have an important part of that. Uh, I didn't even get to tell you guys this. We've had another member of the pagan and metaphysical community pass away due to it. I'm not going to say it on the air because I think we get, like, flagged for it. But due to a very common illness now, was very common at the start of about a year ago. So I've seen two people that were practitioners that I would have loved to sit down and have a cup of tea with and have a talk about health benefits of energy work who are no longer with us 
I wouldn't vouch for them as being the best in their fields because I didn't know them that well, but I vouch for them for being good enough that they're... You were willing to talk with them. I would have been willing to have a cup of tea with them, and I don't, I'm not willing to have a cup of tea with everyone. Will you have a cup of tea with us? Well, yes, I'm, I'm having a massive thing of water with you. I don't think so, I've changed the pH in it either so far. So the, the next experiment follows this same kind of idea as we're going to measure the conductivity of DNA. I can right. feel it happening. I'm going to become the credible Hulk. So, so you this one. You can hear Nathan complain on this one. This, this one at least attempted to, in on its face, be more scientifically viable. They had, you know, three different measurements with three different random controls, and they had it sealed off, and it was right. So, <laughs> so she did the wiggly woos, right? She did the Danielson, right? She didn't really do that. She just kind of put her hands around the, the cylinder. And about 10 seconds later, she, she says that she felt like something happened. So then they went right to reading the measurements, right? They said, okay, so they ran, they measured three times after she affected it. The first one was 6.5, the second one was 6.37, and the last one was 6.2. So they said that she had affected the conductivity by almost double. Because the, low, the, the lower the number, the more conductive something is, right? So she, in effect, affected it by double. She made it. She made the DNA twice as conductive. So okay. So go ahead. That was what they. That was what they concluded. So this is what we went with. You're zeroing a target. I know you're not going to understand this one, Charles, but he should. You'd be surprised. Okay. 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 You're go zeroing ahead. on a target. Right. And you get your shot. They're mm -hmm. all in a line. Well, they're all in a line, kind of like this. Right. Across across from shoulder to the, towards the other shoulder, but kind of diagonal. Okay. Can you qualify on that? Yeah. No. Wait, well. Wait. You're zeroing. You're zeroing. Okay, okay. No, no, you need a shot group like that, yeah. You need a shot group yeah. within, a, within a quarter. With, within a little triangle, yeah. And it's usually a doop, doop, doop. Yeah. Right. So here's the problem with this experiment. The control was so off. These three points that they plotted where it came yeah. out with this even, it was so, so off, it was not in that quarter. So it was already faulty from the get-go. So we're looking at this. It's going all over the place. You cannot start the experiment when it's going all over the place like that because your control is already off. You've already messed up the experiment from the get-go. In order to do it like that, you would need thousands upon thousands of samples that were wild at that point to create your control point and then test against thousands of thousands of samples in order for it to work the same way you do with statistics. Well, that's true, but even at that, they're trying to just do it in one. They're, if right. you notice, they only have one shot to show you what it is. Right. But that, the problem is, is that they started from a faulty position already, and we've already seen that the guy well, doesn't really... He's they're not start, doing anything accurately with the water in the first place, too. They're starting. They're starting with an absolute answer before they even test the question. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Which so is question, a guys. Theory or who, here, who here knows how ohms are are tested? What you do to test ohms? I don't remember, I, I, Nathan. Knows. I do a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Justin, you explain it, and then I'll see if I can fill in the blanks because I'm not perfect at the explanation. Well, ohms are basically testing the conductivity or, or resistance. Within a, within a so you've got to pass a current through it, right? Right. So, so you take one end of a wire and the other end to see if that wire is good. Right. You do that by so, testing to see if electricity can conduct, right? So you've so, got to run some electricity through it to do that, a small amount. Yes. When you do that to something as small as DNA, would it not change the DNA that you're testing? Because you're dealing with, you're dealing with a cellular structure that basically shreds as soon as it gets near static much less whatever current you need to do an ohms test. So I'm looking at this, and I'm just like, so you fried it, and then when you fried out whatever impurities were in it, it became a better conductor. Yeah, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. The other question, that Nathan had another good question. What's the emulsifier that they're using? Because that's a lot of liquid in there for all that liquid to be DNA. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about testing DNA and testing the conductivity of DNA. I don't, you know, I know that you use certain liquids to help read DNA versus, you know, I. it's a very complicated science in and of itself, you know, to simply say, uh, this was just a way for them to to prove what they already think was right or think what, yeah, what but the they're supposed to be. And, and to the untrained eye, it's just I can see where they would buy into it. So, so that brings me that that brings me to something that that I want to say 
it's unfortunate because many people who are brought to the metaphysical area or the metaphysical science or the meta how do we want to say this the metaphysical the art form, the the art form, form. whatever uh, they, they're almost always more spiritual than they are critical scientific. right yeah it's easy to fool them because they spent more time studying the the, the the spiritual nature of the thing versus trying to understand the critical nature of the thing. That's where we get into a lot of these charlatans, which there are a lot of charlatans in this field. And they use a lot of big words and they confuse people, you know? I have fallen prey to it. I'm sure everybody has at one point. Not going to lie, Charles and I got to talking because the way you made it sound when you were talking about this, we were like, I said, Charles, are we going to ruin his worldview of this video? <laughs> And what did I say? I said, no, if I know Justin, he, he probably liked the core of the message, but hated the methods that were Execution. used to convince. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you, we, you, hold on, you hold on. Said, for for like, one moment, you oh, thought, God, wait a minute, you, when have you ever seen me use quantum mechanics to explain something? Never. Never. Why? You know why? <laughs> you, want to. you know why? Because it's bullshit, right? <laughs> I, I don't so, need to... Yeah, I look. I, like you like and I, I said, the first talked about this in in depth. This is the first time I've really gotten to talk yeah. to you about it. So, so <laughs> this is why I knew he was going to be okay because him and I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like I said in the last in, the, in part one, I have a different set of lenses when I look at this stuff. I can already remove the bullshit out of it and see the core of it. And there's a lot for me. There was a lot of good good reminders here. There's a lot of good methodology that pushes me to try some of these things on my own without the nonsense. Because some of this is just high tech oracle stuff. It's like high tech, tech flim flamery. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's yeah. So like at the uh, end of this experiment, I was waiting for them to go ta da! <laughs> right, right, right. Which is unfortunate because I mean, there there's a lot of good they could be doing, and they're just, just trying again. This is the theme here. It's like the the God Squad theme where we we, we hit on the same. <laughs> There's a theme here where they're just trying to prove somebody wrong. They're trying too and, hard. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. Um, I did want to point out that in, in Chapter 2, we do see a new computer, Ellie. It's an Apple computer. <laughs> and about 47 minutes into it. So, yeah, they're not all heathens. Uh, some, some of them have... For some... the record, the computer in... In part one that we were going off about, dude had yeah. a Dell from like, oh, it was almost, like yeah, 2006, 2005. It was this thick, too. It was, yeah. just, it was like that thick. Yeah. Freaking huge. It was like made out of wood and shit. Nathan, yeah. <laughs> Nathan was like, that still has a landline on it. And then he was describing the different pieces on it. And I'm like, you know a lot about computers. He goes, no, I was just yeah. really interested in some of, the, some of that technology at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what? I, I, I will say this. Um, there was a program that I used to use to make my own brainwave tracks. And, like and the binaural problem, tracks? Yeah, 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 the, okay. yeah, the binaural tracks. And the reason I, I had to keep an old-ass Windows XP computer in my house because they never upgraded the software to that. Right? So i will give them a pass on the old shit because maybe there's, there's no updates to the program. But do you uh, give them a pass on the Nike shoe or New Balances? I love dad jokes, so New Balances are in my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that all was right, the other so. thing. Nathan was talking about how he had all this really nice app. He was like, he really is very much about what his his what his reputation is. And then he sees the the shoes, the New Balances, and he's like, this guy is so weird. <laughs> Look, uh, you know what? I have met a few professors in my day. Who were very? A lot of them are very eccentric, and That's they have these. Said. They have these strange quirks. Like everything's put together except for you know, like the tie or the you know. You know, some he kind actually of, said it was probably on purpose because of that eccentric trait that they have. Yeah, they're very eccentric. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing, too. If he's doing research all the time, if those are the shoes that are most comfortable for his feet, yeah, there's the ones he's gonna wear. That's true. All right, so so moving on uh, to Dr. James. Jim Zuski. I had to break that name up because it's very difficult. I, I actually had to rewind it three times to get the pronunciation. Uh, Dr. James Jim Zuski, who's a biochemist uh, at UCLA, UCLA Medical School, I think that's what they said. This next part was one of my favorite parts because I just, not necessarily because it's, it's dead on or anything like that, but I loved how they changed, uh, they took vibrations and stuff and made sound out of it. It was very cool. 
Oh, yeah, that actually yeah. has some really, like, when we were watching it, it had some really good, uh, what is the word, mm, potential for, like, yes. theater. Yes, Like, in right. my head, I don't, uh, what is the name of that? There's an anime, actually, there's several animes, Charles, where they have, where they have like, uh, holographic imaging and whatnot, and they incorporate it into their theaters. And that's kind of what I saw in my head. Star Trek? No, oh, yeah. not Holodex. An anime. Star Trek's not an anime. It's like Metropolis or something like that, I think, maybe? It's an older anime, like 90s. Don't ask me. I know nothing about anime. She's speaking, <laughs> language. She's speaking languages I don't understand. <laughs> then to, you are to, me, Voltron, Vol, to me, Voltron's an anime. <laughs> the only anime I've ever watched. Yeah. That's it. I can't remember the name of it, but... Um, but no, I, I saw that in my head was that that kind of futuristic concept, and I thought that was a really cool introduction. Robotech, Robotech, where they turn the the music into holograms. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. And I just thought that was a really cool concept. That was what I it thought is. in my head. And, and, and you um, know, I didn't see how any of that connected with the other things he was talking about spiritually. Yeah, neither did but I. I thought it was really neat experience. I was like, well, that really looks cool. But at, at no point have they used one thing to quantify the other. So. Yeah, like, my didn't my didn't have a big blank spot for that cause, because it was nothing that was connected together. Well, it was just like I, I, it was I, the intermission point. It's still, well, remember, we're still under the heading of physical body with non-physical abilities. So I think, I think they're still trying on that long line of thought that we can still change things about our body. Uh, and in this, they're measuring vibration, right? A vibration is a, is a big buzzword in the New Age community. Um, it's used to explain every. So before quantum, vibration was used to explain everything yeah, in the true. universe. They don't come right out and say why they're testing this and how it, can, how it connects. That's just my assumption is that uh, it, is, it is a belief that we can change the, our vibrational well, patterns. Well, if I recall correctly, they were using the brain scanner with this, weren't they? They were, uh, and that's kind of my point is that they were using that, the brain scanner. That's, that's great. That proves that you can read electrical impulses. Nope, that's well, a different one. The, nope, you guys are talking about the dream, the, the visualization of the dream thing. That's later. That's oh, later with that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. This was the one with the with the two pictures the side by side. Oh, okay. yeah, so, so this one. So 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 here's the here's the experiment. Uh, they're measuring the vibrations of cells, right? Uh, which is record and which which they're recording a sound. And this wasn't one where it really wasn't an experiment. I, sh I should say that. They didn't really show us the experiment. They showed us the results of things they've done. So they measure the vibrations of cells. First, they talk about they, they show us healthy cells, which makes this beautiful sound. It's a very harmonious, and it's, you know, it, it's very pleasing to hear. Then they show you, and you get to hear uh, what a disease cell sounds like, and it sounds like shit. It's just all... Yeah. If you guys, get to, this, if you guys get to this point... Just don't pay attention to the pictures. Just listen to the sounds yeah. because the pictures yeah, are the actually stupid, and they're not yeah. actually they're not actually the cells. Like I noticed right. that, and I'm like, really? Right. So they like put some pictures in there, and the editor didn't know what he was doing on that. So just pay attention to the noise. Right. And of course, dead cells sound just like white noise. It just sounds like that that yeah. type sound, right? So uh, along this same line. There isn't much to talk about with that because they don't really do an experiment. They just kind of show us what they've done. And we meet a guy named Randy Masters who is a, harmoni a harmonic mathematician. I don't – that's – I think that's made up for the movie. I don't, I don't know what a harmonic – I know what a mathematician is, but I don't know what a harmonic there, there, mathematician is. There, there are people that study the math behind sound, and it's possible that, like, he's someone who went to college – Specifically, to for instance, take apart things like sonnets and great works of of, of audio history like Beethoven and Bach, and then find what what mathematically makes them work so right. that it's appealing to the ear. And again, video game programming got me into this. I kid you not. I I I was really into it when I was younger, and one of the things I wanted to do was understand how you could procedurally generate sound that would be pleasing. And there is a field of science that gets into understanding the math behind what we find pleasing, exciting, terrifying, right. and all of this. And you can actually, with that math, throw that into a procedural <laughs> generation and make beautiful sonnets. You can make terrifying instrumentals. 
The only thing yeah. you can't do is affect it with vocals very well, and the only reason for that was because the software at the time when this was a bigger field of science that was more that people were more interested in didn't exist in a way that you could get a computer to sing. Today, you could probably even convince it to sing in a language with a so, okay, good enough program. Yeah. This is fair, but now that I've, I'm actually in my head space, it, I see this one. You're right. We did jump ahead. We jumped way ahead. Like, mm. two things, two, two sets of heads. Yeah. But this one was where it was just like how we read tone with each other when we talk to each other. He was mm -hmm. teaching the computer to read that tone and produce yeah. what's really going on with that person. I so it that. would just be like our intuition. Only this yeah. came up as like kind of a almost like a white noise looking color spread. And my first when I saw it, I looked at Nathan and I said, "Is that like an ink blot?" <laughs> Because that's what I thought. I, I mean, I know it wasn't because I saw how it was actually producing these vibrations. Right. But when it went to, so then it has the two pictures side by side. And they have, it almost looked like the vibrations in the picture that was supposed to be like the one that told that she was, she was happier or whatever. Nope, that's, you're, you're skipping ahead still. That's the very next one. That's the one where they used, where she was speaking into a microphone. So where are we? This is what I thought we were at. We're right before so, that. <laughs> I, want to say, I want to say to our listeners, one of the things about this part of the movie, so you guys ran into it too, so I'm glad I'm not alone, okay? <laughs> what happens is you get hit with about ten things one after the other, so rapid fire fast that it feels like they're talking about one thing as it concerns sound, vibration, and all these other yep. ideas. And it's meant to draw you to this conclusion that since the universe is vibrating at a frequency, right. you can influence it and pick up on it. But they don't exactly spell it out at the start or at the end. Right. So what you get is this. And what happened to me was I stopped being able to actually mentally so hold information. I, yeah, I think, they, I think they messed up in the editing because yeah. Chapter 3, all of Chapter 3 is about sound and vibration. Yeah. But at the end of Chapter 2, they throw that in there. I think they, <laughs> I think they see, missed it. Because they do, they go, they go. There's, there, there's the uh, vibration of cells turned into sound. Then there's the lady you're talking about who's speaking things into the microphone, and they're making a picture out of it. They called it the porticle, the porticle. Remember the porticle? <laughs> yeah. And then right after that, they go into the person with the with the brainwave thing. Yeah. Where she's yeah. Like, yeah so well, between, yeah. okay, actually, I have notes here. Between that, they actually talk about the double flip theory because I wanted to hit on that one. Yes. They, so so yeah, yeah, I, I have a note on that too. Okay. So, so let's end this. Let's end this video with with your guys' thoughts on on that <laughs> observable universe theory. Okay. So chapter two, minus the vibrations that we got messed up. <laughs> I would say good beginning, strong beginning, the bulk of it, poorly done, poorly illustrated, poorly done. I didn't really know what he was doing. For me, very simply put, there's, there's so much going on within these experiments where we're not being given the knowledge of it, and we're just asked to take it on faith that the experiment is being done as an experiment instead of reading data in a way that benefits their opinions. I just flipped a coin, you heard my coin flip, right? Heads or tails, guys? Tails. tails. Well, one of us was right. It wasn't a coin, it was a ring. <laughs> and that's kind of my point. That's what these experiments started to feel like. And for my purposes, the one experiment I really want information on still remains to be the eye dilation one. It, it, it would warm my heart if they accounted for everything that's involved in that. It yeah. would warm my heart. But for the rest of it, I've seen so little done in controls and controlling the environment of the experiment, and I'm a terrible chemist, okay? I am guaranteed to blow you up if I try to mix any chemicals for any reason. I've done it before, and I will do it again, okay? My parents banned me from a chemistry set for a reason and put me into computers because it's much harder to blow things up with a computer. And I'm going to tell you this, a lot of things that I would know to do, they did not do in terms of things to keep controls for a lot of these. And that worries me so much. So my final word on it, I believe that this section would have been better suited with a man in a tuxedo, two lovely assistants, a small, small black wand, and after each experiment, each experiment yelling, ta-da! <laughs> but that's just me. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure to check out part three, which will come out next week and a part four, probably, and a little bonus. I don't know if we'll call it part five, but it'll be a little bonus why the scientific method doesn't work. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Check out all our stuff. In the meantime, all these other shows are hitting. Allie's still throwing out. What are you working on again? It's called uh, Jedi Journal. Jedi Journal and Wandering Sinai. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, awaken the night within.